Stats in a Wrap. The new podcast series from Eurostat. Welcome to another episode of Stats in a Wrap, the podcast series from Eurostat, the statistical office of the European Union. With this series, we want to immerse ourselves in the world of official statistics and to pick its most delicious morsels and striking flavours to give you, our listeners, insights into the unexpected, the quirky and downright peculiar perspectives that only the numbers can reveal. I'm Jonathan Elliott, your host for this episode, and today is something of a special day because the podcast is celebrating the start of its second season and its 10th episode. Yay! And to mark the new season, we've got something of an unusual addition this week because instead of our usual two contributors, we have not three, not four, not even five, but six statisticians in the Rap Cafe today. There must be a collective noun for stats people. If you know it, please tell us or make one up. Yes, it's something of an experiment today to have this many people, which is just as well because the subject of today's podcast is experimental statistics. The phrase is a curious one and conjures images of mad scientists labouring late in laboratories with test tubes. In fact, Eurostat's icon and logo designating stats that are experimental features a test tube. So what on earth are experimental statistics? Should we trust them? Who does them and why? And how? We'll be finding out from our experts. I'd like to introduce our three teams. This is not a competition. They may be teams, but they're not competing with each other, at least not officially. There are two from Eurostat and one from the Danish Government Statistics Department, Statistics Denmark. Welcome, everybody. Let's start with our guests from Denmark, Søren Andersen and Kirsten Balling. Folks, great to have you on the show. Thank you very much for joining us. Would you like to say what it is that you both do at Statistics Denmark? Søren? Well, my job is to be director for the Department of Business Statistics, which include conduction of a large number of business surveys and the collection of data across the whole office. Lovely. Kirsten? Well, for 25 years, I've been doing statistics in the economic sphere. Uh, economic statistics, you know, the things like growth figures and balance of payment and price statistics and national accounts, that kind of statistics. Lovely. And are you both in Copenhagen? I've got that right? That's right. So joining Søren and Kirsten are the first of our two Eurostat teams, comprising Agnieszka Zajens and Albrecht Wertmann. Your official job title is Head of Unit, Methodology and Innovation. Um, and uh, so and Agnieszka is in the same unit. And so the, you're both sort of right at the heart, if I've got this right, of what experimental stats are and what they do. Is that fair to say? Are you keepers of the flame of experimentation? That's fair to say, and we're struggling hard to bring new things into statistics and also uh, keep statistics up to date with the developments that are now taking place. Well, you have to move with the times. Innovation is vital and modernization is too. You're at the cutting edge. and well, Great, we'll be hearing more from you in a minute. And our last two contributors which I'm calling Team Tourism. They are at the Tourism Statistics Department of Eurostat. Christoph de Munter, an old friend of Stats in a Wrap, and his colleague Simon Blay. Welcome, gentlemen. You are the brains behind the highly experimental and fascinating Collaborative Economy Project, which looks at statistics on short-stay accommodation, Airbnb, Booking.com, and so on, basically people who rent out their flats to tourists, about which we know very little, at least in official terms, but you are about to, or are actually in the process, or have done, you have changed this. So it's really huge. I mean, just for example, is it true that every minute nearly 100 bookings are made on Airbnb, Booking.com, TripAdvisor, and Expedia in Europe alone? Is that true, Christoph? It's an amazingly high number, and it actually shows how important the segment of the accommodation market is. Of course, it also shows how important it is that we actually uh, included in our statistics. And that's just in the 27 member states. I mean, we're not talking globally here. We're talking Europe. That's in the European Union. Yep. So while you were asking the question and I was answering, maybe 100 bookings were made uh, for the weeks and months to come. 
Fantastic. Great. Well, we'll be coming back to the project and unpacking how it was done and the challenges it faced in its development later. But first of all, let's have a look at where experimental stats have come from and why they're becoming more and more important. We have to go to the gurus, the keepers of the flame, Agnieszka and Albrecht. You have the overview. The source data used for statistical analysis is becoming much, much more diverse than it used to be. I mean, when you hear about the traditional sources of data, censuses and registers, it seems incredibly old-fashioned and now we're inundated with streams of information from everything from satellites to smart meters and even mobile phone activity but how does this play into why experimental stats are becoming more important experimental statistics are coming more important because there is a need for faster statistics we saw that now with the crisis the pandemic crisis but also now with the energy crisis that there is a need for data immediately so not only one year after the event happens politicians and the society need this data immediately for solving the problems and this is where we try then to get in, to step in, to find new data sources. I'd definitely rather wait to get quality data, but it'd be nice to have, if it's going to take a long time, I'd like to have updates, maybe release some of the findings a bit sooner than the rest, if it means to just keep like the trust in. I wouldn't want incomplete data because you can't really use that very well, but I'd rather wait. So timeliness is critical here, but the touchstone of official statistics has traditionally been accuracy. The technical definition of experimental stats are that they're ones that are in the research and development stage where they don't have to meet all the quality criteria which are normally required. And these are laid down in Regulation 223 stroke 2009, no less. And they are, let us remember, timeliness, relevance, accuracy, punctuality, accessibility and clarity, comparability and coherence. Agnieszka, could you just help us out a bit with what makes experimental statistics? Yes, so as you rightly said, experimental statistics are in the research and development phase. They are produced in a robust statistical quality context, but they are of a little bit lower level of maturity uh, as compared to European statistics in terms of harmonization, coverage or methodology. So in general, we say that they can score higher in terms of relevance and timeliness, but fall a little bit short maybe on others' quality criteria like accuracy or comparability. Fascinating if we were all in academia, but we're in official statistics here. I mean, I can hear voices of conservative anxiety saying, this is all very interesting, but frankly, you know, keep it in academia. We need official statistics. We need it to be absolutely perfect. Uh, How do you respond to that? I mean, what do you say to people who think experimental statistics that can't be trusted? I think we need both. We need the traditional absolute accurate statistics and probably also slow statistics for fundamental things like when you think of uh, the, um, the total count of the population which has some consequences on the money that is distributed within the European Union. But we need as well fast statistics where users are aware that probably it's not accurate at the 1% level, but which gives then the direction of uh, the development of the problem. So when you are, for example, in a pandemic situation, you are taking some actions and you want to know, do the actions then contribute to improve the situation or do they worsen the situation? And there we can say, at least with this type of statistics, they are improving or they are worsening the situation. So the answer that we are giving is then adequate or should be adequate to the needs for the data. I think in case of like a pandemic or a very urgent emergency, it's very difficult to rely on qualitative data because it just takes so much longer to gather it. I think we cannot, we need to also um, look at very short data, very um, current data. Um, But I think if I want to make up my mind about a topic, I'd rather look at data that has been developed for a longer time in, in a process that takes more time than just a quick decision or a quick thought about an issue. That's fascinating. I mean, I, I won't 
go on about my favorite analogy that uh, experimental stats are a bit like trial pharmaceuticals. I mean, if you're lying on your deathbed and somebody comes along and says, this is very, very good medicine, but it hasn't gone through all the time. Give it to me now. I don't care. I, you know, if it's going to save my life, fantastic. Because there are statistics which are good, but if they come in two months time, they're useless. So they're, they have a sell by date on it, even if they're not ideal. And the pandemic, I mean, Albrecht, just unpack for us a little bit about the pandemic, because clearly there was desperate need for accurate information, wasn't there? And, and you guys must have been feeling the heat somewhat. Yes, uh, this is true. There was a big need for data on infections then, for example. So the number of people that got infected on available beds in the hospitals, also on the people who died. We struggled hard to get these data, not only using the fancy new data sources, but also going directly to the hospitals and organizing the data flows better that we, instead of getting the data a quarter after, but getting the data one week or on the day after they were collected. Do you think we're in a culture now where the need for rapid information, people's expectations to have information quickly, um, is making experimental statistics more relevant because suddenly you've got debates now which can't wait for the information, can't wait for the statistics. Is, are we seeing a trend here, Albrecht? There is clearly a trend. We see more and more data coming and also people now, if they don't know anything, they just go on internet searches and then get the answers immediately. So there is a an attitude of getting answers immediately and this also impacts, I think, official statistics. So and then we have to follow this. On the other hand, what I also can see is that people are confused about the wealth of the information and they are asking is this information correct can we rely on this information and there i see an additional role then by the statistical offices to make a quality stamp on certain information and that's critical isn't it because if you can supply information showing how you created these stats then that sort of protects their usefulness doesn't it uh, yes, we are following a kind of open source approach there. We try to make this um, data or the calculation of the data as transparent as possible. We have a discussion on scientific methodologies. We try to document the methodology, the algorithms, also to have some scrutiny by the public and to make transparent the way the data is generated to educate, but also to get proposals for improvements. I don't really trust information that I read on Facebook because for the last few years there's a lot of fake news on it and um, you often see articles that um, you cannot trust in my opinion because you don't know um, if everything's like trustworthy. Um, so I do not trust information that I find on Facebook. Christoph, if I may just jump in here, we talked about this before. You said that the importance of this kind of information is almost to get ahead of the game because there's plenty of statistics out there. There's loads of information, but none of it is official and some of it is quite dangerously inaccurate. So is there a sort of need for official statistics and the people who work with it to try and keep up perhaps with what could be fake news or just you know, irresponsible information? Yes, certainly. I think it links to what Albrecht said earlier on. There's some kind of market for data and there's no monopoly for official statistics. Official statistics are made by the government, but it's not the only statistics around. When people want to know which artist is singing a song on the radio, they use Shazam. They have the answer in two seconds. Basically, for data needs, they want the same. They have a question and they want to find the data immediately. As Albrecht pointed out, people go to the Internet and there's all kind of data. So in a way, we have to safeguard that there's also some official data for whatever question people might have, and preferably in, in a timely manner. And this is probably where experimental statistics can help to offer statistics that were previously not available, which is exactly the case with, with the projects that Simon and I are talking about. There was no data previously on, on platforms. There are data providers like Insight, Airbnb, AirDNA, but their objectivity is not always clear to users. So this might be where we step in with official data. I mean, we do get it from the platforms directly, but we do have a whole battery of tools to test the data, to process the data. So what comes out of it at the end, what we publish, we assume it's reliable, uh, impartial data. 
I trust uh, the statistics and data from the government because I come from Sweden and in general there is uh, uh, often the data is correct and we have a uh, opportunity or possibility to cross check. So coming to Copenhagen now, because I think there's a side to experimental statistics, which is, well, creative and innovative, and it engages totally other stakeholders. Kirsten, you've described this field as a playground or a sandbox where you can work with universities, academics and, well, theoreticians to look for new methods and new techniques that help stats reveal things they, they normally can't. I mean, you and your colleagues are opening up new frontiers, right? There's another kind of uh, experimental statistics where the statistic being compiled is to a large extent moving away from being directly an observation of what you want to say something about. By moving in that direction, one would traditionally have said that this is not statistics, this is modeling. But there are phenomena that you cannot hope to be able to observe directly and still want to be able to describe statistically. An example f could be when you want to say something about climate footprint, uh, the consumption we have in Denmark has globally. Then you need to know something about the CO2 emissions in China caused by producing the consumption goods that we import from China. And China is not likely to observe this for us, letting us conduct a survey in China to tell us this. So we have to do something else to be able to provide our decision makers with information on what are the consequences of the consumption we have in a rich society as Denmark on the global climate. And in that case, we have to rely on modeling. We have to uh, rely on international cooperation because we cannot do this alone. We don't know everything about China, for instance. And you can say why policymakers want this data when it is compiled using models and international corporations where you uh, let go of some of the control of the production process of this data. And I'll say they do that because they want all the other quality criteria coming out of statistics from independent statistical bureaus, like, for instance, that it's pre-announced, it's produced repeatedly, It's followed by metadata, it's free of political influence, and it's made available to all users at the same time, to mention some of the more important ones. So if we want to compile uh, the footprint of our consumption, we just have to do something else than what we have traditionally done when we have been producing statistics. In doing that, we have to cooperate in different ways. We have to use new techniques. We have to use new ways of compiling statistics. And that is by nature experimental because we've never been there before. With friends and family, I share a lot, but when it comes to the government or other otherwise, I would not like to share personal private data like medical history or medications or whatever, but I don't mind sharing what I earn or uh, my utility bills or uh, yeah, how much electricity I use and so forth, if I do recycling and whatever. Uh, Søren at Statistics Denmark, is there a risk that organisations like yours, uh, you know, an official body that has to look highly correct in all that it does, uh, it could risk appearing, well, a little unprofessional because it embraces these non-conventional techniques? We have traditionally been cautious of going down this way of the experiments because we were worried that it could uh, jeopardize our reputation. What we saw during the uh, the pandemic, as also Albrecht was mentioning before, was actually a breakthrough for the experimental way in the sense that it added to our credibility and it added to our relevance and the respect that many stakeholders uh, showed in, in statistical agencies that we could actually produce usable information in new ways in a very rapid time. Information was really, really desperately needed for the policymakers. Some people, they say that uh, statisticians are not born courageous. They, they become courageous over time. And I think in this interaction with our stakeholders is also proof that we are that we are courageous together. And it, it actually proved a success. So now we have appetite for more. Fantastic. So, well, you're more collaborative and more fearless because you're not sitting in this 
professional straight jacket of ultimate perfection and utter accuracy. You, you can, if you need, say, guys, there's a, a little bit of give and take here. There's a, a little bit of flexibility. You just have to accept that the, the fact that we won't get it completely perfect. Well, we won't and we'll do the best we can. I'm fascinated by the smart meter story in Denmark. For every household and business in the country, correct me if I've got this wrong, you've got a reading from their smart meters every 15 minutes coming into your statistical office. Søren has sort of opened his mouth in shock. I fear I might have my facts wrong. Søren, help me. Well, it's actually, uh, you almost wouldn't believe it. It's not every 15 minutes, it's every 15 seconds. Oh my gosh, right. These smart meters, <laughs> yeah, it, it is actually quite incredible. Hey, minutes, seconds, hey, what a, <laughs> it's an experimental podcast. In Denmark, all households and all establishments, which are obviously all of them consume electricity, they have these smart meters installed to measure their electricity consumption. And these meters, the so-called smart meters, they read the consumption every 15 seconds and the data are collected. And these data have been made available to Statistics Denmark. Actually, it started just before the pandemic hit us. And we have then been using these uh, data for different types of experimental statistics. And uh, I could get back into that in a second. But actually, this is a very good example of a new data source that has uh, multiple uh, purposes for us. Simon Blay from Team Tourism, uh, do come in here. I'm fascinated by this thinking about the German way of doing this. And in Germany, I get a letter once a year telling me, please read your meter and tell us what it says. Once, so you have every 15 seconds, I have once per year. <laughs> I sent the data. <laughs> I, I can comfort you. It was like that only a couple of years ago. So, so it's probably coming to you as well. I think all of this data is used by companies and is also sold by companies from me. Like, for example, if I just send a message, a text message to a friend and that friend is on the other side of the world, I think that data is used in some way, um, maybe not knowing what I said, but for sure knowing that I send a message to another country, to another location. And I think um, those companies, yeah, make their money with, with selling it. Uh, and not everybody in Denmark is a huge fan of Statistics Denmark getting their meter data every 15 seconds. It's quite controversial. Well, actually, I think it's not controversial that we get the data. The observations, they are automatically collected by this uh, private data holder that is kind of responsible for electricity supply across the energy market in Denmark. And they have the obligation to make these data available for research. They didn't have the skills and the infrastructure to do so, but they knew that Statistics Denmark it was uh, very experienced in providing high volume data for research purposes. So they said, could you please be the custodians of these data for uh, research and statistics? And we, of course, said, yes, we would be happy to do so. And we have had no problems with citizens or enterprises not being uh, happy with us having the data and making them available for research in confidential manner. So it's not that we can see uh, an individual uh, identified person using much electricity at some strange point in time. I don't know whether that would be controversial, but all the safeguards of their confidentiality is ensured. Perfect, perfect. I'll come to more of this shortly, but we're long overdue to talk to Christoph and Simon about their amazing project, which is a very good working example of experimental statistics in action. I'll ask Christoph to tell how he and his team collaborated with Airbnb and other huge private companies that typically Eurostat don't deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Christoph. It took a while with lots of uh, trial and error, which is probably part of producing experimental statistics. As you pointed out, it's not easy to get in touch with them. I mean, that's not like an info at airbnb.com address where you can send your data requests. After some attempts, in the end, it worked out with the help of our colleagues in, in DigiCrow, the colleagues in Brussels who work on industrial policy, single market, and so on, because they have contacts with the platforms for other reasons. With their help, we managed to get in touch with the right people. Before, it was basically Eurostat data freaks talking with data freaks in the platform, and we all like data, and it was all nice. But when it comes to like sharing data, you need other people to be involved. For us, it was amazing on the side of the platforms that, I mean, there's investor relations departments who are very sensitive to sharing data. Everything they send is, is to be published only after their financial reporting, uh, contracts people, uh, legal people. 
So it was a whole battery of people going beyond what, what we can do in, in terms of, I mean, knowing the data and the methodologies. In the end, it worked out. Um, yeah, I mean, there seems to be a win-win for, for us and for them to share the data. They're happy that their segment is now better represented in official data. Also, that there's an official source compared to some of the other sources I mentioned earlier on. They're happy to show that they are uh, cooperating with public authorities. This is what keeps it going for the time being. You're asking them to supply you with bookings and footfall and page impressions and all of that kind of thing. But to what extent were they going to give you the metadata, the actual kind of detail of how they got hold of this information, exactly how reliable it is? Because normally what you would expect from your national officers, when you, the people you normally work with, you get an awful lot of detailed information about the information. Did you get that from Airbnb and booking.com? We're getting metadata information, but of course, it's uh, if you compare it to the kind of information we get from the National Statistics Institute in other data streams, then it's of course, it's more and more limited. That may also be one of the reasons why this is labeled as experimental. I mean, the main problem for us was to get the data and to get it out. And we also collect the metadata on our end. So information about, for example, how the attribute stays to a certain month, if they overlap, if they go, I don't know, if there's a stay that goes from the end of May to the beginning of June, do you then add this stay to May or do you add it to June or do you split it or how do you do that? Which kinds of listings do you add to your data set? For example, I don't know, you could think about houseboats or, or tree houses. Are they included in the data set? These kinds of information we collect from them and, and they, they tell us, yes. But of course, um, in official statistics, I would say this is much more rigorous. How did you find culturally your ability to work with organizations which are private sector, entirely driven by market forces and so on, totally different to Eurostat? What was the kind of cultural match like? Did they, did they speak your language? Did you find it easy to kind of communicate what you needed and to get into a useful dialogue? They're quite different organizations, aren't they? Eurostat and Airbnb and Expedia and so on. I remember one anecdote from the early days when we were talking about a statistical disclosure control. So basically saying, if you're in a, in a cell or in a geographical area where the data that you're collecting, where the numbers are very small, and you risk that individuals are sort of detected by that, because if it's just, uh, I don't know, three nights, and you know a guy that offers an apartment in that area, then you know these three nights must have been at this place, right? Um, so usually what's done is that if the number is under a certain threshold, then the cell or the observation, it's not published. So it's, con it's marked as confidential. We had a big meeting with representatives from all four platforms, and we wanted to discuss our approach here, how, how we do this, the statistical disclosure control. And we came prepared, of course. We had this big paper, this big plan, how we would do this, lots of individual steps, et cetera, et cetera. And we were starting to present this, but then at some point they said, yeah, I mean, that's nice and all, but why don't we just wait until we did our quarterly reporting? And then, I don't know, give, maybe give you another six weeks or so, and then you just publish whatever you want to publish. Then we don't have to do all these fuzzy calculations. We don't care really then. I think that story really shows that there's a different mentality going on there. Christoph, is this a, is this a novelty? I mean, do you feel that you're going into territory which normally public bodies don't do? Uh, and if so, do you think there'll be more of this kind of thing? Because it's clearly been a success so far, hasn't it? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're publishing data. It's probably the best indicator that the project actually works and, and produces what it's intended to produce. For a long time, statistical officers have been using or reusing administrative data from social security organizations to produce earning statistics, for instance. The last years, the, the reuse of privately held data has become a hot topic just because there's a few of these companies out there who sit on gold mines of data that is, of course, relevant for official statistics. Our small accommodation platforms project is an example, but there's many other things. And I think this is basically uh, one of the things that uh, Albrecht's unit is, is working on. And our project in tourism statistics was is basically a, a proof of concept or, or a use case. So maybe Albrecht wants to elaborate more on the, let's say, the overall Eurostat or European statistical system strategy in reusing privately held data. I think I do trust private owned companies. I mean, it depends on the company for sure, but it also depends on the research behind it. 
and the company. I think I'd, if I, if there was official research that's backed up and it's it looks legit, I've got no reason not to believe it, for sure, I reckon. Albrecht at uh, Eurostat's Innovation Unit. I've been meaning to ask, the private sector it sits on zettabytes of data and... You would love to get some of it, I presume, that Eurostat would love to be able to enter into partnerships here to help public policy. What is the picture about the relationship between the Commission and big companies like that? We've done quite a number of experiments, for example, getting data from online job advertisements. We have been in contact with uh, mobile network operators to explore some mobile phone data. We have some examples of producing experimental statistics out of it, but for others, we are far from it. So, for example, with uh, mobile phones, there is a big reluctance in working together with statistical offices. So far, the production of statistics is rather limited to some areas and it could be broadened. Absolutely right. Which brings us neatly, I think, to Denmark, back to Copenhagen and their smart meters. Uh, We left them dealing with this tsunami of data coming at them every 15 seconds that happened a few years ago from one million smart meters. Suddenly, a statistical office in in Copenhagen dealing with an enormous amount of information and then having to work out what to do with it. The volumes of these data are are enormous. So what we actually do is also that we aggregate it to be able to, to handle it, including ourselves. So the first thing we do when we receive these data is that we aggregate it to manageable sizes. And uh, then what happened is that we we had access to these data just before the pandemic. That was at the time where we were beginning to have these data deliveries. And uh, then during the COVID period, enterprises, they were allowed the possibility to delay their declarations and and payments of VAT. And, And I'll get to the smart meters in just a second. And normally here in statistics, we use uh, the detailed VAT data as a key data source for our short-term business statistics and for national accounts. So it's a key data source for for really key statistical information. Uh, Especially we use the VAT data in the services sector, which was severely hit by the COVID lockdown. Now then with the absence of the VAT data comes the smart meter data into question because we use the change in electricity consumption compared to the situation before the lockdown as a proxy for change in economic activity and the enterprises. In this way, we could ensure the continuity of the short-term indicators, which were becoming even more important than usually due to the pandemic's high and abrupt impact on the economy. Now, after the pandemic, we now conduct various other experiments with the smart meter data. One example is that we look into how we can use them for making statistics about the construction sector much more timely, because now we can immediately, with the smart meter data, identify when smart meters are being installed at new building sites and when electricity is beginning to be used at that spot. If I may mention just one more example, most recently we have entered a data sharing agreement with the another private holder of data, that is the Business Association for Companies on the Market for Electric Vehicles and their charging stations. Via this agreement, we will have data on the infrastructure for charging points. And together with data on the electricity consumption, we can now deliver new insights on the transition of the Danish transport sector from fossil fuel vehicles to electric vehicles. We use this smart meter information to produce some fun facts uh, during the year. For instance, we look at where do people actually spend Christmas? So we look at how the consumption of electricity changes from being usually a very much in the big cities. And then we can see when people are moving to their second home and now they start using more electricity there. So we can show a picture of where people actually are moving from and to uh, to spend Christmas. And we also had another piece of fun fact we use. We try to look at when do people put the turkey in the oven? We can see it from electricity consumption that it differs from different parts of the country when people start cooking (laughs) for their Christmas dinner. But Kirsten, can we also see whether people are having duck or turkey or roast pork? Uh, No, we're working on that. Okay. (laughs) 
<laughs> <laughs> well, I suppose they have different cooking times, don't they? So you can actually start doing experimental statistics on the length of cooking on a Christmas day to work out which animal it is that's in the oven. And then, of course, you've got vegetarians to think about, all in the cities, I expect. So I'm quite sure that data is being used without my knowledge frequently. Uh, I do not really know what kind of data, but where I live, what I do, where and when I use my bank account, uh, yeah, what I buy, things like that. It's probably used all the time, especially for... Uh, I know companies buy this kind of information to sell your products and so forth, but uh, hopefully it will not be used to um, do anything harmful. I have to touch on being a journalist, I'm always looking for controversy, so forgive me. And I know we've already touched on this, but there is a hotly debated topic, isn't there, about official, that is to say, government access to information about our own private energy use, that is to say, consumer energy use. Kirsten, do you find this causing concern? When people get to know what you can use this data for, then you have to be very particular in explaining how it is actually used. Because as Sun said, we can look at a particular address and we can actually see when is the light turned on and turned off by looking at the electricity consumption. If we are not relied on as an institution to actually care about uh, this data in a way so that we do not use this for playing Big Brother watching you, then you could run into problems. So that's why it's so important when we have access to this data that we use what we have learned about data and data security for many years also to protect this data. It's not a new thing that we know controversial things about people. We've known about controversial things about people for years because we have access to administrative data. So we know how to care about this data in a secure way. So that's very important to tell people that they are not being overlooked by Big Brother because we have access to this data. We're just producing statistics in a more efficient and less costly way. Albrecht, I have to ask you, uh, the world of private data is enormous and getting bigger with big data, new technologies and so on. And public statistical bodies have to move with the times. They have to stay ahead of the game. They're situated within enormous institutional frameworks which don't move very fast, let's be honest. They can when they have to. Covid is a perfect example. But most of the time they evolve quite slowly. I mean, is this a problem? Our experimentation showed that there are huge potentials outside covid the crisis also showed that we are able to use this potential for creating statistics. We are working together with the member states to create this critical mass of introducing new statistics. At the same time, we are also working on the legislation to improve the situation. We are feeling the support then of the heads of the statistical offices and we also have the demand of the users for providing new statistics. Altogether, we think that this creates the condition really for modernizing official statistics and then for succeeding of getting these new data insights, the official statistics. Albrecht, thank you. And sadly, thank you all, um, because our experimental episode must come to an end. We are out of time. The result of the experiment, peer-reviewed with metadata, of course, will be pinned up on the Rap Cafe notice board, so do drop by to inspect them. I'd just like to say a huge thanks to our contributors from Luxembourg, Eurostat's Team Tourism, Chris Thank you, Simon. Thanks for having us. Uh, the Keepers of the Flame, uh, Agnieszka Thanks, and Albrecht. Thank you, it was a great pleasure. And bye. And our smart meter watchers in Copenhagen, Kirsten and Søren at Statistics Denmark. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you all. If you've enjoyed the show, don't forget to share with friends and colleagues where Stats in a Wrap can be found on Spotify, Apple, Google and all the usual places. And if you'd like to know more about the subjects discussed today, just search Stats in a Wrap, Eurostat. 
And of course, join us for the next episode when the Rap Cafe will be dishing up more flavoursome insights, this time about how Eurostat tracks and checks the government finances of all 27 members of the European Union. If you think that must be like, well, sorting apples from pears and at the same time herding cats, well, you'd be wrong. It's much, much more complicated than that. Join us then. But for now, from all of us in the cafe, goodbye.